Well, should we get started here, ready to do some more dancing, but with mathematics? OK. So what we're doing now is studying polarization. So I just put up the heading here. And it should be clear now that that describes how E is pointing. OK. And it can do these things like elliptical, circular polarization, linear, or random. And we need to develop a, a mathematical kind of quantitative basis for describing this polarization, because it's quite important in optics. And so we're going to follow Hecht closely here. And, um, and so this requires paying attention to certain notations. And if you go to different textbooks, this jumps around. Um, and there tends to be a difference between physics and electrical engineering textbooks this way too, which um, is a bit annoying here. I'm going to switch something on you for this section. But the one thing we're going to do is propagate along z. We're going to look at x in the xy plane. Obviously, it has no z component. And we go now to, to the phaser. And what I'm going to do now is switch the orientation of the signs of, of k and omega. So this is what heck does. And if I switch the signs, um, then we're consistent with heck, and the vector forms that we have are related to this equation here. So one morning when you look at electromagnetic theory, talking about polarization, um, one textbook will not agree with another, often because a, a different textbook might have minus here and plus there. The physics is all the same, and even the notation of right and left circular, circular polarization switches. So we'll learn the hack method here, be consistent with our textbook, and, um, and go with that. Yes? Previously, what you, the equations you gave were different, right? I had, um, I, had, um, I had these reversed, yeah. So which one should we follow? Um, yeah. For polarization, follow this one. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I just I, I, I was following something else for the first part of the section. And it follows your classical wave theory. So um, how often do we need to know this? I, I, I can't remember what I do for Fresnel's equations. Um, in the end, you're not going to, when we do these equations coming up, you're not necessarily, uh, well, you just have to remember you start with this for this section. and. On the previous notes, I don't think anything really matters if I switch them around. It's all fairly consistent. In Fresnel's equations, we need to be a little bit careful, but um, not really, because it, it, it disappears there. I, I don't think there's a problem with, with this. Um, it's just this section we have to be very particular. Okay, So this is the most crucial part. OK. So, um, okay, so we're going to have this kind of notation. And um, we then want to start looking at electric fields. So as we saw here, this describes electric field in which plane. Oh, sorry, I forgot to um, finish this point. We're propagating along the z direction. So what does k dot r do? Well, k just becomes kz. All of 2 pi over wavelength is only along the z direction. So this becomes k um, z times z hat. But that's the only term. So I'm just going to write that, oh, sorry, dotted with r. OK? So this k z just equals k now times z hat dotted with r. And the only r term that dots with that is the z term. So this just equals k z. And so that's what appears in here. OK, so there's plane waves like this only. So now in the plane wave, I've got this electric field confined only to the xy plane. So if I want to describe this vector, then it has a component along the x direction, ex, and a y component along the y direction. So I can now look at this vector and all its different uh, modalities in this plane. OK, so, so that is a um, starting point. Um, I've got theta there. OK, so now what I'm going to do is let ax, oh, sorry, do it this way, ex equal ax. Um, doesn't seem clear why I have to introduce another unit, but what I want to 
to actually see. And I'm going to do a normalization later. I'm going to have a Y component, but we now have to allow for flexibility. If I want to distinguish linear from circular polarization, then I can't just let AX equal, let AX be a real, no oh, sorry, just these are real numbers. And this is a real number. So now I have to allow for the possibility of circular or elliptical polarization, which requires EY to be phase delayed or advanced over EX. So if I take the magnitudes of these quantities, then I, need, then I realize that there should be a phase delay or advance on the Y component. So this I to the delta is what's going to manipulate the time delay on when EY is coming up relative to EX, with this being the Z direction in front of me. Okay? So, so what we allow is E to ha X to have an amplitude AX, EY to have an amplitude AY, and there's a phase difference between these two components that will help us to find the polarization. So delta here will help us distinguish things like elliptical or linear or circular polarization conditions according to its value. It's going to define this. And this is the phase delay or a phase shift. And it's in the time domain. In the time domain. OK, so if we're married to the z-axis and I have only x, y components, we could throw this into a polarization matrix form. Where the first term will be OK, um, the x component. So I'm going to define this this way now. I won't write the vector parts anymore. The matrix represents a vector. So these are the x and y components for a vector quantity. So I define it that way. And then when I use the upper parts here, I have um, its magnitudes, the real parts of the magnitudes and a phase delay between these two quantities. So if I, for example, if I look at the source, so that means the minus um, z hat direction. That's looking at the source. Then x, for example, could be like this. y hat could be there. OK, so z hat comes out of the board. The energy is coming towards you. And if x is x cross y, yep, that's right. Then what I would see is I'd have a vector here, for example, that would be the magnitude of ex. And I have a vector here that is the magnitude of ey. And there's a ratio between these if I project to here. I have another angle to introduce. So there is the sum of those two vectors if they're in phase. And this angle psi then describes the relationship of the ratio of EY to EX. OK, so why do I need psi here? For example, if EX and EY is in phase, and um, I had X this way, Y X cross, yeah, I think I had this backwards. I, um, I should really do X and Y. X cross Y goes that way. So if X is, say, 1 volt per centimeter and Y is half a volt per centimeter and they're in phase, then I can take the tangent, tangent inverse of 1 rise over 2 to figure out what angle this polarization is. And when I turn time on, it would be polarized like this. OK, so tangent psi will tell me how big y is relative to x, and it defines a certain angle. But it gets more complicated if I make delta out of phase, then I could turn this into elliptical polarization or other states of polarization. So delta is not psi. Psi is just related to the ratio of EY to EX. And then we can further manipulate time delays in when y turns on relative to when x turns on. 
Yes. Um, I, I, I need to describe when does y start oscillating relative to x. So if x comes out to here and y starts now, I have um, a quarter period phase delay. Okay, so that's a 90 degree phase delay. If they're up at the same time, then I have a zero phase delay. So, so that's what delta tells me. Um, AX and AY can be anything as separate things. It's just timing. Okay, so if delta is zero, I just need to advance these in phase. And if it's one degree, I just delay Y by one degree over one period. That's all that means. So I don't try to impose any other um, connections with these other parameters. It's completely independent. That's the only thing that matters. E, this um, psi angle is just the magnitude of the y component against x. All right, so it sometimes is zero, then it's only x polarized. Okay. All right, so we need these quantities to, to cover these two things. So let's look at an example. Let's try to describe a case of y um, linear polarization. How does that look? So I'm going to. Um, Try to make things simple. Let's freeze time at t equals zero. And let's also make the initial phase zero. So I've got to go back and say, OK, the initial phase is zero. I'm going to go to t equals zero, and I'm going to plot the z-dependence. OK? And this has two x components, x and y. But I'm making y linearly polarized. So what does that mean? It means ax equals 0 equals ex. There's no x component. All right, so this hand is gone, and I just have this y component. OK, so what is, I'm going to plot it like this. I'm going to take x and y. Which way does z point? x cross y. Let's bring it out of the board. So there's, sorry, which way does z point? It points like this. OK, so we can visualize that. And what is the first, what is the, at this time, what is the value of electric field and where does it point? OK, I'm going to go to z equals 0. Right, so that term's 0. That's 0. That's 0. OK. So I need to go to electric field. OK. And I need to define the value for delta. So let's make delta e also equal to 0. Then what happens if delta is equal to 0? Then the magnitude of EY is just AY. Okay? And I go all the way back. I could put AY in here. And this all has a value of 0. E to the 0 is 1. So which way does it point? And how big is it? Yes. Right, it's a maximum, and it's pointing up. That's the starting point. So I can draw my vector like this at those conditions up there. And I could write this, for example, as EY, just magnitude. Um, well, let's write it this way, AY. OK, E. And I'm going to now let it go forward in, in, in Z. So I can write this as a magnitude number ay, delta 0. And if I turn z on, what does it do? At z equals 0, this is 1. As I go forward, it's just going to decrease. And it's going to increase and look something like this, with these being vertical vectors. OK? So. As z increases, I'm taking the real part of the phaser. So I need to take the real part of this quantity here. And that becomes cosine kz. So this is just cosine as a function of z plotted towards us. So then what is the magnetic field? OK, it oscillates along the x direction. Which way 
Which way does h point from here at z equals 0? OK, everyone's got the right hands up. Good. Go ahead. It points this way, indeed. At this point, it's in the negative x direction. So there is my h x component, OK? And it's going to be 0 when, when um, e is 0. It's going to come out this way and then go back this way. So it looks like this. It's a bit hard to draw. I, I should have two colors of chalk. All right. And so you see how h looks. What's the equation for h? Sorry, that should be the curly h. Um, h, x. What's the equation for this? It's proportional to e, y, right? What else do I need in here? I need 1 over eta. And what's the sign? Yeah, it's not positive, it's negative. Why is it negative? When EY is up, I'm in the plus Y direction. And at that moment, H must be negative. Right? It must be negative. And then it'll oscillate, as, as shown. OK? <laughs> A little tricky. It sounds like you're following all of this. OK. <laughs> Barely, though, right? I'll just write this out, too, just to remind you of the material properties. OK, so we were able to guess how h should look. So notice that hx would be in phase with um, ey, for example, here. OK, so that is a good start. OK, so any questions so far? OK, so we'd like to reduce the description of polarization so it doesn't depend on how powerful the electromagnetic wave is. The electromagnetic wave could be 1 volt or 2 million volts per centimeter, and the polarization could be the same. If I have linear polarization like this along the y-axis, I'd like to have a formalism which is independent of, of the power of the field or the intensity of the field. So that requires that we normalize the e-vector. Go ahead. OK, one sec. Question. Yes. <laughs> I know they're hard to draw, so probably not. <laughs> Some people are good at it. I, I know a lot of people don't have those skills. Okay. Um, yeah, it's not something I emphasize. I do like nice art, of course, but um, OK. So what we end up inventing is this vector here. So it's like electric field, but normalized to unity kind of amplitude. So it's going to be like AX and um, AY, except now we use A and B. And sorry, there's so much notation. I didn't invent this, but um, what we have is um, a unit vector, and in fact, this is defined to be J, and J is known as the Jones vector. So it's used to describe the polarization state of a material, uh, sorry, of a field. It's the polarization state of an electromagnetic field. And it has the property that as a vector, um, matrix vector, it has magnitude 1. The way to look at that is that A time, well, A squared is real, OK? A squared plus B squared must be equal to 1. So the magnitudes must be um, orthogonal in here. What you should do is take this times its complex conjugate plus this times its complex conjugate, which takes you to there, OK? So in a complex plane, you force this condition. OK, so um, this notation is just this notation reduced by taking AX squared 
plus ay squared and dividing, maybe dividing, let's do it this way. If we divide that by ax squared plus ay squared, then you get the Jones factor. Okay? So now we don't care how big electric field is. We divide by that quantity, and then that vector becomes the Jones vector here. Okay, so what, what we now are ready to do is assess the Jones vector for different states of polarization. So we're going to start dancing again. Okay? Let's interpret what this means. So when I see the Jones vector, I have A, which has no phase associated with it. It's a real quantity. And then any phase delay is related to delta as before. And I should ask the question, what if I want to start the electric field at a different phase from here? What if I want to move the peak ahead a half a wavelength? Where do I, what do I change of all the equations up here? Who's following all of this that can say that? You are? Which one? Delta. No, delta doesn't change anything. Uh, well, I, it, it does, sorry, it does artificially, but that's cheating because um, um, delta is supposed to only represent the phase delay of y with respect to x. So we have to actually go deeper back. Um, the answer is right, but it's not the one I wanted. <laughs> yes. So I go back and change theta. So I made theta 0, and if I change theta, then I shift the starting point. So theta represents the starting point for electric field of x. See that? And then if I want to change y relative to x, I change delta. OK? So delta then changes y relative to x. All right, so there's a lot of parameters here, but you can see why they're there based on all the conditions we want to meet in describing the electric field here. OK, so I'm going to now describe the different states of polarization. We've inter been introduced to them before. So I'm going to consider delta equal to 0 or pi. What does this imply? The Jones uh, matrix here will be A plus or minus B. OK? So A is the length of the electric field in X. B is the length, relative length of electric field along Y. Okay. And if it's plus or minus, what does it do? What kind of polarization might I have? Notice there's no phase delay in here. Okay, so this actually defines a linear polarization. Okay. All right, and let's see how that comes about. With this um, um, condition, let me just get my thoughts here. Um, just, um, so what um, happens here is EY is either in phase or pi out of phase with X. So when it's in phase, that means that EX and EY are expanding in phase with each other, going to their maximum amplitudes. If it's pi, then EY is opposite, negative of what it would have been. So when X is coming up, Y is going down. And so it's just a kind of 90-degree flip of these conditions. So if we want to assess this, then again, let's consider making t equals 0. And let's consider theta equals 0. And when we take E now, it's equal to the real parts to remind ourselves of what's really going on. We have x and y components, and I have e to the i k z. I want to look at what happens as a function of this. So just building from that equation up there, this becomes the real part. and when I take the real part of E to the I, K, Z, that gives me cos theta. So I can now assess what's happening to the magnitude vector of electric field and, and then just follow what cosine KZ is doing. Um, this uh, works well here. Normally, I can't do this. If I have an I in here, then that would switch the cosine to sine. But it turns out that I don't have I in there. I either have 
1 or, or minus 1 for the coefficient in front of b. So this is quite easy to figure out. Okay, so in this condition, whoops, maybe I'll, I'll just go under here. Um, let's, let's play on this panel here. In this condition here, then, I would have x and y is drawn like this. If I go to um, distance A along this, that would represent the direction of electric field. In this direction, I go a distance B. So if it's plus B, it goes up, right? If it's minus B, the other condition, it's going to be down there. So what kind of electric field do I have? I would take these points and I would have an angle psi equal to, uh, tangent psi equal to B over A in this case, or I would have a vector that goes to here where psi would be negative in this case where I have a minus B. So tangent psi, remember, equals B over A, and it's either plus or minus based on what condition I defined up here. Okay, so just with my arms quickly, if this is um, x and y, if a equals b, right, psi is 45 degrees, and I have linear polarization, it starts here, and as I turn time on, this, the, the sum of the two vectors follows this angle. If I chose um, b minus and a equals b, then I would have this condition as a starting condition. The net vector is there, and so this is polarization that's rotated 90 degrees from the other case. And if I make B shorter, then I'm getting closer to the x-axis, and if I go to minus B, it's this way. All right, so just trigonometry describing all forms of linear polarization is, is here. Okay, one additional point in this, just to normalize this, j is equal to 1 over ex squared plus ey squared, and take the square root of that, and you take the x and y components for the matrix, and notice that I can write this in the following way. So this length here is cosine psi. This length here is sine psi. That's what tangent psi does. So I can actually write this as cosine psi over, whoops, sine psi. And this is automatically normalized. So this is the value then of A and B for linear polarization. Okay, so depending on how big, well, basically, I can just think of linear polarization as defining psi, and, it, and I can rotate psi all the way around, and A is big if psi is zero, and whatever, I just use high school trigonometry to describe this kind of condition. So this is linear polarization, again, just to remind you of the Jones vector. Okay, and you can always find H by going 90 degrees from E and the, following the right-hand rule. Okay, so let's, um, I want to keep that up. I'm going to erase this now. Yeah. So, there's, so that's pretty clean. Let's now consider example two. And we're going to let delta now equal plus or minus pi by 2. Okay. And we're going to force A equal to B. So when these two things are both true, we know that that implies that the magnitude of X equals the magnitude of Y. Okay. They're not absolutely equal because this is 90 degrees out of phase of EX. So what is the Jones matrix for this? 
the Jones matrix will then be 1 over root 2 for normalization. And then if we have 0 phase for the x component, what should the y component be here? If delta is pi by 2, where's the equation? If I put pi by 2 in here, what do I get? I get i, right, or j. And if I put minus pi by 2, I get minus j. So I'm forcing y to be 90 degrees out of phase by introducing that term. So this becomes then plus or minus i. And that comes from e to the, e to the i delta term that's in there. So I'm putting plus or minus pi by 2, OK? So the meaning then is when I see y is 90 degrees out of phase, I physically imagine my electric field vectors now as such. If x is amplitude 1, I have to delay y by 90 degrees. It starts here. And depending on whether this is plus or minus, as I retract y, either I go up or I go down. If I go up, then the electric field vector circulates this way. And that, that um, I think, is right, uh, right circularly polarized light. And if it rotates the other way, it's left circularly polarized light. Okay. So to study this, we're going to let t equals 0 make um, the starting phase for x at theta equals 0. And I need another board, so I think we can just go here. OK, so this is um, what's going to turn out to be circular polarization. You should put that beside the box there. And, um, and to get an understanding of what's going on, again, let's remind ourselves where we're coming from. The, the electric field vector is the real part of epsilon. And e to the i kz minus omega t um, plus theta. So those terms are all 0 except for kz. So I want to now follow what happens to x and y. So what will the x component look like in this? Well, this term is just 1 over root 2. So I get a magnitude of the x component, let's just call it a now, over root 2. And when I take the real part of e to the i kz, this just goes as case cosine kz. So there's my reference point for the x component of electric field. And if we now solve for ey, what is different here is I need to pull in this plus or minus y term, plus or minus i term. One second. And um, when I put i in here, what happens is when I take the real part, i will work with the imaginary part, so I end up with i squared. Okay? And I get a sine function, not a cosine function, after taking the real part. So what I need to put inside, so what I get from this is 1 over, or a over root 2. And if we work it out, I need to put in plus or minus i. Uh, oh, let's write it out. Real part, plus or minus i, e to the i kz. So this will equal, let's go up here, a over root 2 um, sine kz when I have um, this is for delta equals um, plus i. Then b is equal to i over 2, a root 2, uh, plus i over root 2. So those are the parameters from the Jones matrix, the b part, delta equal to, ah, jumping ahead, delta equals pi by 2, sorry. Okay. So for plus pi by 2, b is plus i. 
I put in plus i, and that i times sine or cos plus i sine pulls out this form of a over root 2. This should be. Okay. No, I, I have a mistake. It's minus, excuse me. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, because you have an i squared here. And for the other form, you end up with plus a over root 2 sine of kz. Okay, so basically it's the same magnitude of x and y components. They both propagate as sine kz, but, um, sorry, um, the y component propagates as sine kz either minus or plus, but sine is 90 degrees out of phase with cosine. So that delay leads to the electric field always being on and rotating in a circular path with z. So let's, um, let's distinguish these two conditions here. Um, let me just finish this. This is delta minus pi by 2, and v is now minus i over root 2 for this case. OK, so you run cos on x, sine on y. Obviously, you get circular polarization. I think you can see that. Which way does it rotate is the next last thing I need to do. Question? We're going to try. Kind of no, we've defined a Jones vector and we're interpreting what it means. So I'm now going to draw how the electric fields rotate as a function of z, and we're going to distinguish right and left circular polarization. Okay. So what, what I'm teaching you is there's Jones vectors. When delta is is um, zero, the Jones vector is one one. When it's plus pi by two, this is the Jones vector here. So what does that mean in terms of electric field? We go backwards of what we had just introduced. Remember, I came forward starting with that equation, ended up with the Jones vectors. Now I'm defining a particular Jones vector value and going backwards to interpret what electric field does. So our, our next step is um, we're going to describe right circular polarization. Okay. This turns out to be the case where delta equals minus pi by 2. So it's this condition here. And let's construct that now in a kind of drawing. So I want to look at this as, as a function of z. And how does this look? So I'm going to draw a z-axis like this. There is x and y. Okay. And we're looking at you, x and y. So if z equals 0, which way does electric field point? When z equals 0, which way does the electric field point? OK. x is cos, z equals 0. It's peaked, right? OK. You got that? And I have to use this equation, and z equals 0. There's no y component. So at this position, I need to write my vector like that at z equals 0. OK, so I'm using this equation here in this example. And I'm also always using this as a reference point. So vector field starts there. Now, to get the sense of rotation, I need to turn on uh, I need to turn z on. So let's go a quarter wave length further away. So quarter wave length away, what happens to this term here at a quarter wave length away? z equals a quarter wave length. This becomes pi by 2. So x has gone to 0. What does y do? Sine peaks at, at a quarter wave length away. And it has a positive sign. And hence, I have to draw an arrow up. And so this is a distance of a quarter wavelength away. Okay, And then if I go another quarter wavelength away, x will point this way, and y is 0. And then the next quarter wavelength away, y is pointing down. Uh, sorry, the x component points down. There's no 
uh, y component points down, there's no x component. So if I fill in the gaps, then I can draw another electric field um, here. This will point up at 45 degrees the other way. This will point backwards at 45 degrees. There'll be a point where this points um, up at 45 degrees. And so I will have a spiral, um, a, a corkscrew kind of shape that looks like this and rotates. I didn't draw that very well. But it, it um, has a description of a right-hand rule. If I, my thumb points along Z, my fingers are rotating following this corkscrew vector right. And so this is why it's called right circular polarization. You put your thumb here, and you then follow with your fingers which way this thing is rotating. Yes? So you would draw this same thing, um, e, cr e cross h, so h has to point down at this moment, right. okay? So it's, so it's just offset, and it has the same shift, shape shifted a quarter wavelength back, that's all. But I'm not going to draw it on here because I, I didn't do a very good job on this first one, all right? So if I look down this axis... Well, this is maybe not enough room here. Hang on. If I look down this axis, and y, x and y, what am I seeing? I'm initially starting at this position with the electric field. Okay? And which way does this rotate initially? As z is increasing, it starts pointing up. So, what I see is that the electric field vector follows a circular path like this. There's the new electric field, and this angle here is just kz. That is just kz. So at a quarter wavelength, I've got a pi by two phase change. It's up, and this is stretched out like that. I've projected it into this direction. So when my thumb points on the propagation direction, my fingers rotate clock, um, counterclockwise. So what I see KZ doing is I see a counterclockwise rotation for the case of um, right circular polarization for delta equal to minus pi by 2. Okay. So then this vector, J right circular polarization, is defined to be 1 over root 2, um, 1 and plus i for right circular polarization. Yes? This is all happening at time equals zero, right? So this is the picture of how the field, electric field looks at t equals zero. What happens when you turn down? What do you think happens? Which way does it move? Oh. Yeah, so you just take this picture, that rigid structure just moves forward. <coughs> So if I sit in one place, I'll still see the electric field oscillate. And you've helped me ask the next question. How does this vector look if I make it z equals 0 and turn time on? What does this vector do? If you can do this, you've got really good spatial orientation. Which way does it rotate? Okay, this is counterclockwise right now, expanding kz. So, so how does this look? If I am up right now and I turn time on, this thing moves forward. Which way does the electric field go? It turns clockwise. This approaches me, then that one approaches me, and the vector actually goes backwards. So the vector looks like this when I make um, z equals 0. And this angle here, ah, so let me make it bigger. This angle here is omega t. Sorry that it's so compressed. That angle is omega t. So it rotates the opposite way. But that's not surprising because I have these sign changes between z and time. So they, they actually go opposite. Okay? So it's peculiar, um, but, but we need to pay attention. This is maybe the most complicated moment. Um, elliptical maybe gets worse. I'm not so sure. But 
<laughs> but defining right and left circular polarization is very tricky. So it's defined in terms of the Z direction using our right or left hands and drawing out this corkscrew. And once you figure that out once, then we remember that the plus sign here relates to right circular polarization. Okay, yes? Yeah, this is t equals zero, exactly. To be complete, that's very good to ask that, yep. Okay, any other questions? So then, the last example is, um, well, there's elliptical too, but hang on. So let's consider the case where delta equals, that's minus pi by 2. Wait, did I get that right? I think I made a mistake. Whoops, 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 whoops. whoops. Excuse me, I, I made a mistake. Um, this is minus, <laughs> excuse me. That's huge error. Please make sure that's minus there, because I chose delta minus pi by 2. OK, make sure you get the minus sign there. Minus i, and it's right, everything else is correct here. That's the only error. OK, so if I now make delta equal to plus um, pi by 2, then this turns out to be left circular polarization. And in this condition, ex, I'll just rewrite the equations from here. Ex is a over root 2 cosine kz, and ey is, is a over root 2, um, where was it, minus sine kz. So basically, this is easy to construct. Now that we've practiced this once, let's just quickly make sure we can do this. So there's the x and y components. The starting point is the same, right? So I will draw my electric field vector. This is where we are at z equals 0, t equals 0, and theta equals 0. OK? And then as we go forward in distance at the same time, what happens is the y component goes down first. So I can draw at a quarter wavelength away. It would be there. So it would go from there to there. Then it would sweep over this way. Then here would point to the left, then up, whoops, too close, then up, and then vertical. And so this would sweep like this. I don't know if I did that well. Hmm, not so great. And what this describes then, um, this, I can't use my right hand on this. It is my left hand rule. So I put my thumb this way, and my left hand will describe the rotation sense. So that's why it's left circular polarization. So in this circumstance, we can look at y and x. And the electric field starts here. OK? And as a function of time, it now goes this way. And as a function of z, it goes this way. So it draws out a circle. It's a fixed radius circle. The electric field never turns off. That's on a circular path. But it is doing sine and cos on x and y. It's synchronized by um, a quarter wavelength shift. And the Jones matrix for this and it's 1 over root 2, 1, um, and um, plus i. OK. That's left circular polarized, excuse me. OK, so this is the opposite direction um, corkscrew. All right, so we've got to do elliptical still. I just have um, a quick point to throw in here. Um, 
by symmetry. Um, let me let me go to here. This, this takes about a minute. Okay, so here's an interesting property. If I take JL um, star dotted with JR, or transform maybe, it turns out this is equal to 1 over root 2, 1 minus i. I've taken the star and star 1 over root 2, 1 over plus i. Oh wait, is it a star? Um, no, I think I don't take the star, sorry. Um, then this turns out to be equal to zero. So this demonstrates the idea that these are orthogonal type of matrices. They, they represent a kind of unique state each. And it turns out that a single photon is JR or JL. JR or JL. It is either right circularly polarized photon or left circularly polarized photon. That's the way the world was created. It actually has a rotation on it. It has an angular momentum associated with it. So how do we make linear polarization? I'll come back to your question in a minute. So what about linear polarization? Can it be a single photon? Can a single photon be linearly polarized? No, it's not possible. Linear polarization requires that we have JR plus JL. We must have one photon that has the same phase as the other in a way that when I do JR plus JL, what do I get? When I add these two vectors together, it turns out, well, let's maybe write it out. I get 1 over root 2, 1 minus i, plus 1 over root 2, 1 plus i. And when I add these together, the y part disappears. Okay. And that is equal to um, 1 over root 2, 2, 0. Notice it's not normalized because there's two photons present. And how do I create linear polarized? So we know um, right circular polarization could be this way. Left circular polarization is like that. So what I'm doing here is I am summing this polarization. And if you add my the two vectors of both arms, what is it doing? It is just oscillating like this. That's linear polarization. So linear polarization is always at least two photons. And how do I rotate the polarization? I have to do a phase delay as I'm circulating. I don't think, I can, I don't think I'm coordinated for this, but <laughs> as this is up, I should delay this one and then rotate. And maybe if I lean like this, it works. OK. <laughs> so that, that is what linear polarization is. So there's an interesting symmetry in these um, Jones va uh, matrix um, or Jones vector quantities. Okay, we have some more um, vector quantities to talk about. I need next to talk about elliptical polarization. Um, so it's a little bit heavy here. Please review this, and um, we'll do elliptical and um, and um, phase retarders next. That 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 would finish polarization off. <laughs>